So, uh, Rabbi Rami Shapiro, you're probably one of the few people who've asked very deep questions about what Judaism must mean for it to be uh, meaningful in the 21st century. And I just wanted to ask you, you know, as, as Hillel was asked to answer in one foot, what is most important uh, that Judaism become or emphasize so that the next generation will uh, take it into their lives. Okay, let, let me just challenge the premise that I'm one of the few. I think a lot of people are asking this question, but not out loud. Okay. I, I ask it out loud, and, and I have you know, an answer. And I think, standing on one foot, that Judaism is all about becoming a blessing to all the families of the earth. Bereshit, Genesis, chapter 12, verse 3. That's what Judaism is about. All of the mitzvot, all of the holy days, all of the halakha, everything that is that we call Judaism ought to be in service of us being a blessing. And in your books, you've uh, taken uh, new interpretations from the original texts, but you've kept the Hebrew texts as they are. Can you tell us kind of why you did that? Yeah, I think that what ties us together are the texts. And I want to, I, I, I believe the texts are living documents. The text comes alive when there's a, a human, living human reader. And the rabbis throughout the centuries used their uh, breath and the, their vowelization of the fixed text to make the text say, say things that it didn't say generations earlier. One, one quick example. So you get um, Leviticus 19.18. Ve'hafta l'reyecha kamocha, love your neighbor as yourself. So Reb Nachman, in the 18, died early 1800s, Reb Nachman said, you could read it, ve'hafta uh, and you shall love, l'reyecha your neighbor, re'echa is your neighbor, kamocha as yourself. Or, because you're just changing the breath, you could read it, ve'hafta and you shall love, l'ra'echa, your evil, your shadow side, kamocha, as a part of yourself. Now, did Moses, assuming Moses wrote it right, did Moses know that? No, I'm not making that an anachronistic claim. The text is alive with the imagination of the Jew. You could breathe lots of meanings into it. So my thing is, let's not lose the text. A lot of your work has been in interfaith, working uh, with Christians, with Buddhists, with Hindus. Uh, many of the people who enjoy our Jewish community uh, .org, uh, are in relationships uh, with people from other faith traditions. Um, what would you advise the Jewish member of, of a family uh, who's living with non-Jews? How can they uh, make Judaism uh, accessible, interesting, and not threatening to non-Jews? How can they make it something they can share? If you focus on values, and if you focus on the existential questions that the text is addressing. So, love your neighbor as yourself, the text is addressing the question, how do I deal with someone who's different than me, who's other than me? The way I do share my Judaism is I say, look at these texts, they're talking about human issues, not Jewish issues, because these are human things. How do I love my neighbor? And then you look at the commentary to discover, well, how did they do it? And then you, the, the conversation is, how do we do it? I mean, the word God is English, and it doesn't appear in the Torah, right? When I look at Jewish texts, and the word that we then translate as God, I find a word that is so, in, it's intrinsically compelling, because it's, it's the verb to be. It's the, it's, it's, God is a happening. God is actually what's happening throughout the universe. God is, it's process theology. God is a, God is a verb, God is dynamic, and God is not personal and not self-conscious and not willful. And God doesn't say, oh, you're gonna get cancer and you're gonna get cured from cancer. That's not how it operates. But I, I don't have an anthropomorphic God who's gonna save me, who's gonna spare me anything, or who can fix anything for me. You know, I don't pray to God to intervene in my life to change things. I don't believe there's that self-conscious being that can do that. So my prayers, uh, I mean, you know, the word uh, heat bone and newt, one of the words that we have for, for contemplation, means self-observation. That's what I do. I, I use Hebrew mantra, I use you know, Hebrew prayer as a way of centering and simply observing what's going on and realizing that whatever it is, it's all the divine manifesting, but it's just it's reality happening. And I have to accept it as it is so I can deal with it effectively. Asking God to change anything, 
would mean asking God to change everything. Now, communal prayer, I think, is different. Communal prayer is when the community gets together to affirm its values. When I go to a religious a synagogue service, I'm looking at the liturgy. What are we proclaiming? What are we saying about ourselves? Um, how is it understood? I don't want to walk into the synagogue and pretend it's um, 1216 and not 2016. I don't want to pretend that I'm living in a medieval world where I don't know anything about evolution, and I don't know anything about cosmology and astronomy, where I never heard the big bang smash and chirp. You know, I never heard that, and I think the world is flat and all that other stuff that they believed. I don't want to have to pretend that way, and I don't want to pray in, in, a, in words that create a world view that I know is false. So a lot of it has to be redone. But I think we're afraid to do it. Wonderful. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you.